So, hey, if you've got a Bible there, turn with me to Matthew 25 this morning. I want to just take uh, a couple of weeks this week, maybe next week, maybe the week after. I want to talk to us about the issue of gifts and talents. And the reason I want to talk about that is because I think there are a lot of misconceptions about gifts and talents when it comes to the church and when it comes to God's people. And I believe that we are called to do great things for God. Amen. I, I don't think that you've been created the way you've been created. Now, let's, let's, let's be honest that all of us are on this journey towards what I like to refer to as becoming fully human again. I was created by God, fashioned and formed, but I grew up in an environment that didn't necessarily push me towards believing what God said about me or encourage me to do the things God wanted me to do. I grew up in an environment that distracted me from God. Anyone else in this room, you grew up in an environment that didn't, didn't encourage you to focus on God, not because people were bad, but they just encouraged me to focus on other things. And I lived a, a youth that was distracted from the reality of God until the age of 19 when I surrendered my life to Jesus and I, I stood on a roundabout in the middle of the Pacific Highway with trucks and buses going around and truck fumes and everything like that and all the noises you could think of. It certainly was not the quiet, holy moment sitting in a church with a tear in my eye, surrendering myself to Jesus after a, a fight with worship music in the background and loving people around me, gathering, putting hands on me and praying for me. No, there were buses and trucks and people honking horns looking, what is this idiot doing on a roundabout? Open your eyes, son, can't you see what, you know? And so, but on that roundabout, I began this journey. And the best way I can describe it is from the moment I met Jesus, I began on a journey to becoming fully human again. Because God created me with intention. God created me with purpose in mind. God created me to, to do something. Now, when I say that, I don't mean that God wants me to be rich and famous. Rich and famous is not the goal. The goal is simply to find what God has for me and do the thing that God gifted me and created me and fashioned and formed me to be able, <coughs> be able to do and to be the person that he made me to be. I am, am a human being with certain strengths and things that I do well, but how many of you in this room know there are things I don't do well? And that's okay. <laughs> Hands down, Jackie. <clears throat> how many of you know that you're not perfect in every area? How many of you know that you have weaknesses and shortcomings? Anybody else or is it just me? There's about five of us. Wow, I'm, I pray, Lord, against the spirit of pride that is here this morning. Every one of you, whether you like to hear it or not, I'm going to do the, the right thing in love and let you know you're not perfect. You don't have it all together. I know, Debbie's in absolute shock. If Chris was here, he'd agree with me. None of us have it together. But we're on a journey to discovering who we're meant to be and finding those things. That, that, that God put us here to say, if you will operate this way, you can be very, very productive, not just in terms of this natural world, but there's this thing. How many of you know Jesus spoke about this thing called the kingdom of God? Anyone read anywhere there? It's, it's hard to miss. It's hard to miss. As a matter of fact, probably the number one topic that Jesus spoke about was this thing called the kingdom of God. This kingdom. And when I think about a kingdom, what is a kingdom? Well, in a very practical sense, a kingdom is a place where the rule and reign and authority of that king exists. So the kingdom of Saudi Arabia is where the laws of Saudi Arabia and the rule and authority of the king of Saudi Arabia exists and is enforced and practical, in practicality outworks itself. That's a kingdom. And so the kingdom of God is a world or a place where the reality of God outworks itself. God's values, God's way of doing things, what God says, God's authority, it outworks itself in that place. So when Jesus made statements like the kingdom of, of heaven is at hand when he was present, he meant that because he was a person filled with the spirit of God who lived out the kingdom. He was under authority of God. He did what God called him to do. He was the person God called him to do. He had a goal and the goal was to be in the place and do what God fashioned and formed him in his mother's womb to do which was to die for you and to die for me. And each of us, we're not going to die for each other. Praise God, only one man ever had to do that. But there are still things that God has for us. And those things that God has for us contribute to this thing that Jesus called the kingdom of God, where the rule and reign and authority of God is the most important thing. Not only important in theory, but it's outworked in practice. 
Go to the kingdom of Saudi Arabia and try to live outside the rule and reign of the king of Saudi Arabia and do things that are outside the values and the setup of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. You'll lose your head. You'll lose your hands. You'll lose a whole bunch of body parts because it just doesn't happen. When you're in the kingdom of Saudi, you do what the kingdom says you do. And we're in this thing called the kingdom of God. Now, praise God, he's not lopping off body parts when we fail. Amen? Isn't that a good thing? I don't see anybody with missing limbs. You're either perfect or God's incredibly gracious with you. I think God's incredibly gracious with you. Debbie, I know he's incredibly gracious with you. Chris told me. So there's this thing called the kingdom of God. So there's this thing called the kingdom of God. And it doesn't matter. <laughs> Never far from my heart, Debbie. On my side. So Jesus preached about this thing called the kingdom and we have been given things. We've been made a certain way and fashioned a certain way to contribute to the establishment of this thing that Jesus called the kingdom of God here on earth. Isn't that exciting? You, you, you get to participate in and contribute to something other than your bank balance getting bigger, other than your body getting fitter other than your mind getting more intellectual and stretched. By the way, they are all good things, but they're not full stops and ends in themselves. All these things are enabling us to be able to better participate in the building of this thing called the kingdom of God. In its very essence, what is the kingdom of God? It's simply establishing a place in our life where the rule and reign of God is not just a theory, but it's outworked. And in doing so, we begin to take that to the society and the community and the world around us and we begin to bring that flavour and we begin to take a stand for certain things and we begin to say, hey, the kingdom lives in me. I'm under the rule of a kingdom and it's not the kingdom of Alan Kirchin. Because if it was the kingdom of Alan Kirchin, there are limitations, there are weaknesses. Uh, I would probably say yes to things I should say no to and no to things I should say yes to. But I've, I'm putting myself under this kingdom this authority this reign and this rule of jesus and gifts and talents god has given us things that are a part of us that he wants us to walk in and to operate in and to move in not just for the building of our own lives and our own popularity or bank balance or, or portfolio but to be able to use those things to bring the kingdom to earth now let me preface by saying this I'm not preaching anything about serving in a church on a Sunday morning or coming in and cleaning a building or bringing morning tea or getting on a worship team. They're all wonderful, good things and some people have gifts in those areas and they do that. But you know what? Jesus was speaking to a bunch of people that on Monday were going to work. Paul wrote to people who on Monday were going to work. James wrote to people who on Monday were going to work. Not everything in this book is written. Sometimes I think when we read what these writers wrote, we read it and we wrap it in this Christian world, uh, i.e. maybe church on a Sunday and so on, and we try to outwork it all into that context. Yet these guys were writing to people that were having to get their children out of bed for school on Monday. They were writing to people who were going to go to work on Monday for a boss that didn't appreciate them. Or, or an industry that was failing and going backwards and they were trying to work out, if I don't do something in the next two weeks, we could end up in the red. There were all kinds of practical real-life situations that were taking place. So this stuff is practical in the sense that it's usable everywhere, anywhere, not just here. So when I talk about gifts and talents, and I encourage you in the next couple of weeks to just have a think about it. I'm not saying let's discover this so that we can all find something to do on a Sunday morning for an hour and a half. Or let's all discover these so we can all get on a cleaning roster or we can all get on a communion roster or we can all pick up an instrument and ask Daniel, can I come and join the worship team? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about establishing the kingdom of God by using the things he's given us in the world that he's placed us at the time. Does that make sense? Yep. Awesome, good. Matthew 25. In, in, in Matthew 25, there's a, a series of parables and I won't go right into the nitty gritty of it, but let me just explain it to you. At the end of Matthew 24, Jesus is having this long conversation and he, he encourages his listeners. He says, here's the reality. I'm coming back. I'm, I'm, I'm going to come back, people. But I'm not telling you when. Because I don't even know. The Father knows. And he hasn't given it to me. So I can't give you what he hasn't given me. All you need to know is this. <laughs> the most important thing is that 
live your life with the full knowledge that I'm going to come back one day. I'm going to come back one day. I will return. Maybe before you depart, I'll come back. If not, you'll depart. He's still going to come back. Either way, you and him are going to meet up. We're going to meet up one day. I don't know the circumstances of that, but isn't that a great thought? One day, I'm going to meet face to face with Jesus. I'm going to be with him one day. Get that in your head. You won't be afraid of death. I will meet with Jesus one day. And this is what Jesus tells him at the end of Matthew 24. Then in Matthew 25, he goes into a series of parables. Parables are stories that, 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 that sort of teach a point. And he starts by talking about these 10 um, um, virgins, he calls them. It's what the Bible calls them. And not, anyway, these 10 ladies. And the bridegroom is going to come. And he shares his story about all 10 of them are trimming their lamps. They've got to get oil in their lamp to keep the, lamp, the light going because there's no street lights and no Duracell battery flash torches they can click on as they run down the street. To, so they, they've got to keep their lamps lit. And cut a long story short, what happens is that the bridegroom comes and five of them have got their lamps ready. They've got, they've got oil in the lamp. And they go, man, we, we're going to go and meet him. The other five go, we've got no oil. Can you give us some? No, no, no. We've got enough oil for ourselves. You should have thought about that. You knew he was coming. Why were you sitting on your backside doing nothing? You should have had oil in your lamp. We had oil in our lamp. You didn't. We're going to meet the bridegroom. Because the bridegroom wanted us to meet him, to greet him. Therefore, we needed oil in our lamp. So what did they do? These people, they had oil with them when the master arrived. Then he goes on and he tells another one uh, about a parable of the talents. Or, or, or some, some versions say the, the, the bags of gold or the coins or whatever. And, and uh, he comes to three servants and he gives one of them one uh, bag of gold or one talent. Another one two, another one five. And then the master goes on a journey and then the master comes back. And then there's a series of interactions between the master and each of the people that were given something. And what happened was, cut a long story short, the ones that, 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 that when the master arrived, they had produced profit, got a raving review on Facebook. They got a, a great review, five-star review. But there was another one that didn't have anything and things didn't go down too well for him in that parable. Just like the five virgins who didn't have the oil it didn't work out good for them why because they were expected to have oil in their lamps when he came and the guy that didn't have profit it didn't go down well for him why because he was expected to have profit when the master returned so the master's coming back we don't know when but when he does come back you better have oil in your lamp when he does come back you better have some profit from what he's given you and then he goes on and he talks about the sheep and the goats and we all know the sheep and the goats everybody love keith green the musician keith green you ever heard the sheep and the goats Fantastic. If you haven't, go home, Google Keith Green, Sheep and Goats. It's awesome. Piano playing. Da -da 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 he's awesome. And he tells the story of the sheep and the goats from Matthew 25. Bottom line of the story, what happens? There's a whole bunch of guys there. And he separates the sheep and the goats. And one group, he says, you know, you, 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 you fed me. And you clothed me. And you visited me in prison. You did all these things. Enter into your rest. And their response was, I don't even know when we did that, Lord. How did we do that? There was fruit in their life. The fruit was there and they produced things that were kingdom things by looking after all these people. And then the other group, they said, well, he said, you didn't do this. And they said, well, when were we, when, when we supposed to do this? We didn't even see you. We weren't even focused on that. So again, you've got this group of people that produced good works that when the master came back, he saw those good works. He said, man, you guys are going to win. You other guys, you're in trouble. The guy with the two and the five talents produced, master comes back and says, you produce something, you win. The guy with the one, you lose. The five virgins come, they got the oil, they say, you win, you guys lose. In other words, there's something about God, whether we like it or not, that he's gifted us and he's put us here for a reason. And when he comes back, he will be looking for some type of fruit. He'll be looking for something, some kind of production from our life that is born primarily out of who we are and what he's given us. I've, I've got a, a, a bag of seeds here. And uh, can you do me a favor, Jackie? Can you run around and just give everyone a couple of seeds for me while I'm just, just a handful of seeds? And, and please don't eat them. They're not edible unless, of course, you're a parakeet. Any parakeets in the room? If you're not a parakeet, please don't eat the seeds. But I want you to hang on to these seeds because I'm going to ask you to do something at the end of the service. I'm going to ask you to, to, to hang on to that seed. And for the next few weeks, while I speak about this issue of gifts and talents, I want you to hold those seeds. Maybe when you go home, put them in a plastic bag or something and write seeds on or write the word talents on them. And I want you to, over the next few weeks, as we talk about this, I want you to look at that, that seed. And I want you to have a think 
about your gifts and your talents and what is it that God has given you. You see, I believe this. God wants fruit from our life. Matthew, uh, John chapter 15, verse 1 and 2, Jesus said this. He said, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Doesn't that sound harsh? He says he cuts off branches that don't bear fruit. Not because he doesn't love them, but because the branch is there to produce fruit. If it's not producing fruit, then we'll get rid of it. Because we'll take away from that branch so the sustenance ain't going to a branch that's producing nothing. Let that energy and sustenance and vitamins and minerals go to a branch that is. A little bit like the parable of the talents. You got one, you did nothing with it. I'll take it off you. I'm going to give it to the guy with five. It makes no sense. But what he's saying is this, that, that I want you're called to bear fruit. And if you're bearing fruit, I'd rather be pouring into that branch than a branch that's doing nothing if you're not producing fruit then no one's going to notice whether the branch is there or not anyway because you don't produce anything john 15 1 and 2 i'm the true vine and my father is the gardener he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so even a, even a, a branch that bears fruit gets pruned it still gets cut back. It's not like if you bear fruit, life is rosy and everything's great. And then he says, I prune you back. But there's a reason why I'm pruning back because you prune things so they produce more. They produce more. So that it will bear even more fruit. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. In other words, he's saying, you know what? Here's a reality. You're saved by grace. There's nothing you can do to receive salvation. You are saved by grace through faith. But once you walk through that door of salvation, your growth, hey, you've got, you got a part to play in that. You've got a part to play in that. You ever have those people that just rock up, hey, I'm here, look how special I am, I'm a, I'm a celebrity, and a celebrity, they'll, they, they, they'll walk into to places and you read the stories and stuff and they get upset because a policeman pulled them over for speeding, like, hey, but I'm a celebrity, you know who I am? I'm here, celebrities here. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, the rules still apply. Christian or not, we still got to work and we still got to do things and we still got to make choices to grow and to change and to develop just like a person without Jesus has to as well. The difference is that we've got this thing called the Holy Spirit on the inside of us and the momentum of God pushing us towards the direction of fruit production and growth. We got a bit of inside information and a little bit of inside help. <coughs> Colossians chapter 1 verse 10, Paul writes this, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, bearing fruit. I could spend the next 20 minutes and just pluck out New Testament verse after verse after verse that talk about the fact that God is looking for fruit. God is looking for fruit, something to be produced through our lives. God wants to see something produced through our life. God wants us to be fruitful. And the reason I want to spend a few weeks talking about gifts and talents is because I believe there are a lot of misconceptions about gifts from a Christian perspective that cause our gifts to be unfruitful. There are a lot of things that we think about gifts and talents that are actually holding us back from being fruitful in our own personal lives, but bigger than that, being unfruitful in terms of trying to build the kingdom of God in the place where God has put us because of some of these misconceptions. So I want to talk about some of these misconceptions next week. I just want to lay a bit of a foundation this week and get you thinking about gifts and about talents. Here's a reality. How many of you know I can only produce the fruit that I have the seed to produce? Give me an apple seed and I will go away and plant that thing and look after that soil and nurture it. You know what I'm going to get at the end of the day? Apples. Why? Because that's what was in the seed. The DNA is in the seed. So if I plant an apple seed, I'm going to get an apple tree. I'm not going to get an orange tree. So here's something for you to think about. If I can only produce what the seed produces... Doesn't it make sense that God is only looking for fruit in the area of the seed that is given me, not in every other area? Let me put it this way. I am not a business person. I have not been gifted to generate millions of dollars to invest into the kingdom. I wish I was, but I'm not. And it doesn't matter how much I wish and how much I, I'm not. It's not my gift. So here's the thing. When I stand before God, he's not going to look at me and go looking around the tree going, where's the fruit of a million dollars? God, you never gave me the seed that I could put in the ground to produce a million bucks. Hate 
to break this to you, and some of you probably know this. You know, when I stand before God, I probably won't be judged for whether I was a great pastor. It's true. If, if, if according to Ephesians 5, that pastor and prophet evangelist, if they are gifts and, and things that God gives, guess what? I am pastor by title. I have a badge that says pastor at Arise Church, but my primary gifts and stuff that are in me, I'm not a pastor. I'm, I'm not the guy that will sit there eating beetroot sandwiches with you, talking to you about all the... I mean, I can do that, and it's not that I don't love you. You know what? It's, that, it's not my primary gift. It's not the thing. It's not the seed that God put inside of me when I was created and said, that's the seed. Therefore, because that's the seed, that's the fruit I'll be looking for when you get there. Now, now my wife is extremely pastoral. She's probably better at that than me. Um, so you know what? When she gets there, God might look around her tree and go, where's the fruit of, of, of this pastoral gift that you have? And he'll find fruit. But he won't look at me and judge me for that because he's placed certain seeds in me and I have to be aware of what those seeds are because they're the areas where I'm expected to produce fruit and every one of you your gifts and your talents are like that seed you're holding in your hand it's something that God placed in you it's something that God has given to you and when God says he's looking for fruit he's looking for fruit from that particular seed whatever the seed is that's in you you can't produce fruit if you don't have the original seed but your gifts and talents are like seeds inside of you and so we don't have to be good at everything and great at everything we don't have to dive into you know some people try to do too much with their life some people are that scattered but, but trying to, uh, I guess, discover and find what is the seed that God's put inside of you so that you can use that seed to produce fruit, not just for your own benefit, but for the benefit of the kingdom of God. You can only produce the fruit with the seeds that you have. Now, let me give you a very simple definition of what I believe a gift or a talent is. Let me give you a simple definition. Anything with the potential to produce kingdom fruit hate to break it to you but there's not just 12 spiritual gifts there's not just depending on which book you read it'll, it'll, it'll all determine have you, anyone done that you, you spent time and you've read books on gifts and all this stuff and it really just simply depends on the author and the angle who you read as to how many gifts that there actually are floating out there in the universe but uh, anyway just, you just need to know anything with the potential to produce kingdom fruit is a gift it's something that god's placed within you that god wants you to develop and use so that eventually that's the thing that he uses to establish the kingdom of god that's your little bit that he uses to establish the kingdom in the world around you everybody has gifts and talents everybody has gifts and talents i want you to say this to yourself i have gifts and talents just say it okay now say it again but actually mean it i have gifts and talents some of you believe it, some of you don't. Some of you, some of you are looking at yourself going, yeah, I've got gifts and talents, and some of you are looking at yourself going, well, I don't know. Well, let me tell you something. When you were fearfully and wonderfully made by God, there were seeds put in you, gifts and talents, and I want to just tell you today, unequivocally, if you believe the words of th these ancient writers, and keep in mind, a lot of these ancient writers knew Jesus personally. They walked with him, um, and if they didn't know him personally, they wrote on behalf of people that knew him personally. So these guys knew some stuff about Jesus, even before all the interpreters get involved, or whatever your slant is, the fact of the matter is if you believe this stuff then you would know that you were put here for a purpose and that you have gifts and talents and things individual dna a fingerprint of god in you you do every one of you are special special unique every one of you have something that god put in you because god wasn't just making billions of people and going i'm just going to hand pick a few superstars to do some really big stuff and the rest of you no, no. God put seeds in you, invested seeds in you. So everyone has gifts and talents. Here's the thing. Some of your gifts and talents are written in bold capital letters. There are some things in your life. We've all got more than one gift and talent. Who knows that? Is there anyone in this room and you can only do one thing in life? That's it. Raise your hand. 
Good, because if you raised your hand, I would have told you you've just done two things. You listened to me, responded, and you raised your hand. That's two things. Everyone in this room can do lots of different things. We've got lots of, of talents and gifts and things that, that we can do and so on. But how many of you know there are some of those gifts and talents that are written in bold capital letters over your life? They're the things that you know, I can do, I can do a, a whole bunch of different things, but that thing, it's like bold capital letters. That one really stands out. Here are some questions that you can think about when we think about what your gifts and talents are. Uh, what, what do you love to do? I know that sounds very unspiritual, but God likes it when you like doing things. God's not necessarily going to place a call on your life or put a gift in your life and then make you hate it. God knows human nature a little bit better than that. It'd be kind of counterproductive. So, so what do you think? What are some of the things that you love doing? You know, some people just love making coffee. Some people love making coffee and it's just a passion. I, it does my head in sometimes when I talk to coffee lovers because they, well, they talk about the grains and the granules and they talk about the... And I'm like, mate, I grew up on this cafe blend 43. You know? Um, mind you, nowadays I drink a caramel latte, which my wife calls a girly coffee. Any other men drink lattes in the room? Okay, thank you, Daniel. Thank you for your honesty. There's two of us that drink girly coffees. We don't care. We're secure in who we are. We'll go out for one afterwards, eh? You and me. Um... <laughs> Some, but some people just love that. You know, some people make jewelry and they just make amazing jewelry and they love making jewelry. Some people make music and they love. Some people love when they get to spend time with, with little kids. They just love, they walk up to you at church and they just always want to play with your kids. You know, some, some people love uh, 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 making coffee for somebody else. Some people love playing sport. Uh, some people love painting. Some people absolutely love going to work and picking up a hammer and tools and chiseling away on a building site. Some people love sitting in an office and designing. And arch- Everybody has those things that they really, really love. Maybe that's, that's a part of that seed of what God has placed inside of you. Maybe that's a little bit of a hint, a little bit of a blues clue along the way. You want to know blues clues, the little kids thing? Maybe that's one of those little, little, little tr- things like Hansel and Gretel. It's a breadcrumb. And if you follow the breadcrumbs, you may just come to a point of discovery where you start to go, maybe that's just not something that I'm good at and love doing. And people say, maybe it is a bit of a gift and a talent. These are breadcrumbs. Um, what just seems to work for you? What is it that you do and it just... It just seems to work. Anyone have things like that in their life? If they do certain, then they just, it just works. You, you, it, it's not like you've spent weeks and months trying to, it just works for you. Um, I, I find that, I do a lot of sports coaching, and one of the things I love about coaching, I kind of fell into sport coaching because I found it just works for me. I, I get a group of kids together or adults together, and I know where we're going, and it just works. Some coaches have got their plans and they've got their, and, and it's a big, and, and I just sort of seem to find it comes a bit more naturally and I get there with a bunch of guys at the end of three hours after running around in the hot sun, we all sit back and go, that just worked. How did it just work? Well, it's a little bit of a breadcrumb. It's a bit of a clue towards that seed that God has placed on the inside of my life. What do people around you acknowledge that you do really well? What do other people see as the fruit that's growing off your tree? When people look at you, what do they, what do they say to you? What's the common theme? That when you, you, know, when you do this, it's, it's great. It, it blesses us. It, it, it's, it's, what are the things, the feedback that you get from other people? I've never had anybody come to me and say, gee, when you make a coffee, it's so awesome. I make terrible coffees. That's why I don't make my own. Praise God for Leslie because she makes me one on a Sunday. I can't make it even instant. It's terrible coffee. I'm not a good coffee maker. No one's ever said that about me. With, with, with Well, it's not true. A couple of people have with a meal, but it's fairly hit and miss. Quite often the meals aren't that good. And I don't get people going, wow, how did you do that? You're just such an amazing cook. Most people are going, is there anything else we can have? Um, but that's okay. I don't mind. See, I'm not going to be judged for my cooking skills if it's not a seed that he put in me. He's not going to look at the tree of my life and go, where's the fruit of cooking? It's not a seed. But there are seeds in my life and there are seeds in yours. What do people around you acknowledge that you do really well? What's that thing that you do that people keep coming back saying, I want more, I want more, I want more. I, I, I know this with my, my wife, that when people sit down with her, she's just got this amazing gift that people like to talk to her and they open up their whole world to her. When we lived in Brisbane, it used to drive me crazy. I remember the first day we moved into a new house that we were in and she goes down the back to hang out washing on the line. 
And it don't, I'm, look, I'm not the most uh, smartest tool in, in the shed, but here's the thing. It doesn't take 45 minutes to hang out a basket of washing. So I'm sitting upstairs, and I think we're going to have a coffee or something, and it's like 40 minutes. For, she's not back. So I walk to the back balcony, and here she is, and I see the neighbour over there. We've never met them. We've just met them. She's leaning over the fence. She's bawling like a baby, telling Jackie all the heartbreak and everything in her life. Nobody wants to do that to me. Nobody. Nobody. I've got to get pliers and things to try to get people to talk to me about their deeper stuff, but they walk up to her and they just want to give her stuff. Just want to talk and unload and open up, and it's a consistent thing. And people always say to me, oh, your wife is so easy to talk to. And I go, yes, she is, and waiting for the comment about me, and I never get anything. <laughs> your wife is so easy to talk to, and you can talk too. Thanks. That's great. But you know what? I'm not going to be judged that way. God's not going to be looking at the end of my day at the tree on my life and going, well, how many of those deep and meaningful things were you counseled and helped people through their deepest? He's not going to do that because it's not the seed he put in my life, but it's a seed that he's placed in there. What is it that you do that people keep coming back for and wanting more? You know what? Maybe it's your work. Maybe it's a work thing. You, 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 you work in this... Daniel lays carpet. And maybe people just keep coming back and they just keep wanting more. And we've got mechanics here and everybody just wants your service because you're such a good mechanic. My mechanic's amazing. I've put about 30 people onto him. He hates me now because he's so busy. He can't even have holidays. But he's a great mechanic. And so what is it in your life that people just keep coming back for? They just You're good at it. I love going to Debbie's place because it's, it, there's always a pile of food and stuff. Whenever you, you go, we're just coming over here, you know, to have a bit of a chat or have a bit of a meeting or something like that. And it's the hospitality is there and it's laid out. I want to keep going back for more. That's a hint, by the way. <laughs> Invite us back. What energizes you when you do it? What, what when you do, you get energy out of it. Yeah, everyone's seen that movie, Chariots of Fire, and Eric Liddell, when, when he, there was a quote that he made in the movie, and somebody asked him about running, and he said, you know, when I run, he said, I feel. When I run, I feel the pleasure of God. It energizes me. When I do that thing, it gives me energy. And other people look and go, you are a crazy nut job. How can you get energized running? Is there anything in the world more boring than running around in a circle? No! But he's Eric. Oh, I feel the pleasure of God. Well, that's a bit of a breadcrumb. It's a Hansel and Gretel breadcrumb towards that gift, those talents, those things that God's placed in his life. <coughs> what are the breadcrumbs for you? What is it that energizes you? What's God said to you? Over the years of your life, what are some of the things that God has spoken to you and told you about yourself and about the future he has for you and, and the impact. And so what are some of those things? So these are all just like breadcrumbs. These are all little trails that can help us lead towards the reality of, of, of knowing that, you know, you do have gifts and you do have talents. God has deposited seeds in you. And they're the areas where he's looking for fruit production. He's not looking for production in areas where you don't have seeds. So the first thing I just want you to know about gifts, everybody has a gift and talent. Secondly, um, there's no better. They're only different. There's no better gifts. They're just different. No gift is better. Gifts are just different. 1 Corinthians 12, 21. Paul writes this. He says, The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. I don't need you. Imagine in the parable of the talents, you know, we've got the, the five-talent man, a two-talent man, the one-talent man. And, and the one-talent man obviously has one talent. The five-talent guy had five. I relate to the two-talent man because he's like average Joe in my books. The, the, and I, I feel like the average Joe. So I relate well to the two-talent man. But what if that two-talent man turned around and started looking down on the one-talent man? Said, I don't need you. You got nothing. Your talent is not as valuable as my talent. Your talent's not as big as mine. It's, it's not as needed as mine. But Paul says, no, 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 nobody can say that anybody else's gift or talent is not needed. Nobody can say that about anybody else's gift. It doesn't matter what you think about your gift. They're all needed. The eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. 
Or maybe the two-talent man, if you looked up at the five-talent man, he might have been tempted to fall into a bit of self-rejection. Well, well, well God, I, I can't, my, what can I do with two? I mean, if I had five, of course I could do something. I mean, God, if you gave me five, <laughs> obviously I could do something with five. Who couldn't do something with five? But God gave me two, so I can't really do much with two, can I? So what's the good of my two? Let me tell you, I've got this little thing on my finger. Okay, can everyone see that? Anyone know what that's called? That's what it's called, a wedding ring. But you know what it actually is? It's just a piece of tin. There's billions of them. Billions of them. You've got them. Other, who, who else in this room? Put your hand up if you've got one of these things. Rod's got one. Anyone else? Yeah, put your hand straight up for me. Let's look around. Gee, there's tons of them. There's heaps and heaps and heaps of these little things that we call wedding rings, which is really it's just a piece of titanium or gold or steel or whatever yours is, aluminium, who cares? It's just a piece of metal that's formed into a circle that I put on. It's just a gift. It doesn't get its value from what it is. It gets its value from who gave it to me. This woman gave me that. It's a ring. Lots of people have got rings. Your gifts and talents, lots of people have got them. Lots of people have got them. When we sit there and we um and ah about our gifts and talents and we compare ourselves with other people, if I had what you had, of course I could make a difference, God. Or we look down on other people and belittle their talents and their gifts. When we get into this judgment mentality, pride or self-rejection because of what we do or what we don't have. Hey, what you have, the seed that you have, here's the thing, you need to understand this. God put it in you. You can work with it or you can try to fight against it for the rest of your life. The choice is yours. But here's the thing. It's not necessarily about the gift itself that makes it special. It's the fact that your Heavenly Father chose you and gave it to you. It's about who gave it to you. So don't sit there and go, well, I only make coffee or I can only build houses or I only this. I wish I was leading worship with thousands of people in a stadium. I wish I was preaching to 10 million. I wish I, I wish I, I wish, no, no, no. Start finding and discovering that seed that's in you because that seed is valuable. God gave it to you. And that seed is the very thing that he placed in you so that you can contribute to what he wants to do in the world around you. And that seed is the area of your world where when he comes back, that's the fruit he's looking for. He doesn't want you to be him. He doesn't want you to be her. He doesn't want you looking at other people. So many people in the church are doing nothing with the seeds that are in their life because we're sitting there comparing ourselves with others. We're wishing we had something else. We're so down on ourselves. We don't think that we've got's important. I want to tell you something. When the whole body does its work, the whole body grows. When every one of us begin to accept the seed that God's placed in your life and work with that seed that God has placed in your life, trust me, you will find purpose, you will find meaning, you will find a dimension to your existence that clicks into gear that's well and truly beyond anything that you'll discover trying to operate outside of it. You might get rich, you might get famous, you might get popular, you might make lots of money and get lots of things operating outside of that seed. But when you stand before God, he's not going to care about that. All he cares about is what you produced with the seed that he gave you when the guy with five talents when the master came back he said you know what i've produced another five he said awesome i'm going to give you some more the guy that produced the two he said i produced two the master didn't say well you failed didn't you look at this guy over here he produced five no no he said i gave him five he did with what he did with that seed and he produced i gave you two you do what it wasn't about what they had it wasn't even about how much they produced it was the fact that they did something with what they had that pleased the master so I want you to think about that. You have a seed in your life. It's given to you by God. It's special not because the world says it is, and it's not unspecial because the world says it's not. It's not special because it's done with billions of people or makes you a lot of money. It's not unspecial because of the opposite. It's special because of who gave it to you. The God of heaven created you, fashioned you, and gave it to you. 1 Peter 4.10 says this, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others doesn't say others in the church only people it just says others other people the gift that's been given to you you should use that gift to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms people there are many gifts and there are many talents what is a gift or a talent it's anything that is has the potential to produce kingdom fruit 
in your life, through your life, whatever. You are loaded with gifts and talents. And if you can just connect with that gift and talent, if you can bring that seed to life, if you can work with that seed, then you can make a huge difference in your life for the kingdom of God. God is looking for fruit from your seed, not somebody else's, your seed. So let's spend a few weeks and think about this and maybe go on a bit of a journey and discover what some of those seeds might be. Because if those seeds are lying dormant, wouldn't it be great? to begin to see some flowers bloom and a bit of fruit blooming on those trees. I'm praying that for you and I'm praying that for myself over the next few weeks. So Father, we just thank you for your word. God, we want to thank you for uh, today. God, thank you for the fact that every person in this room, God, whether they believe it or not, it doesn't change the fact that you have placed seeds inside of them, God, that you have put things in them, Lord, that you have created a world, God, that you created. You understand how it operates. You understand what it needs. You understand how it functions, God, not just in the natural, but in the spiritual and and that unseen realm. God, you know exactly what this world needs and you're saying that it needs us. And you're saying that it needs what you've placed in us. It needs the fruit that is going to be born from the seeds that you've placed down on the inside of your people right now. And I just pray, Holy Spirit, would you breathe on those seeds in everybody's life? Would you send the wind of your Holy Spirit, blow, God, on those seeds in people's hearts, God? Begin to fan that flame, God. Begin to bring to the surface, God. Begin to give people boldness. Begin to give people confidence in that area, Father. God, begin to open people's eyes to see, God, This you, you don't... You don't care if I don't produce fruit over here, God. It's not the seed you put, but over here, this is that seed. And I want to dive in to that field. And I want to see something produced and something changed for the glory of God and for the kingdom of God. And Father, I pray in the next seven days as we go from here, Lord, every person in this room, give us a chance to tell somebody else out there, someone that right now is struggling to hold on, someone right now that doesn't know the truth of who you are. God, somebody that's looking at this world and getting confused day by day, feeling like there's no truth, there's no anchor, there's nothing solid to stand on. God, give us a chance to meet that person, to bump into them and to tell them, hey, let me tell you some good news. There is truth. There is a rock to stand on. There is stability and there is purpose for your life. And that's found in Jesus. Give us the chance this week, God, I pray to tell somebody that good news and that great message, Father. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Everyone said together, amen, amen, amen. amen. God bless you guys. Hey, um, next week, yes, we will have some masks up there for you. Look forward to seeing you uh, back here again. There's tea and coffee next door, so don't feel like you've got to rush off. Hey, if you feel like the Holy Spirit's speaking to you, you feel like God's been saying something to you, man, why don't you turn to somebody? Why don't you go and talk to a friend or somebody say, hey, I'm not going to walk out of here and keep it to myself. I just want to say to you, I think God might be speaking to me about this. Would you pray with me? Would you believe with me? Let's 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 fan that 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 flame, that seed. Let's not just walk out, meeting's over, get on with life. Come on, let's let's... Let's make ourselves accountable with some of the things God's saying to us, eh? Amen.